Good day, everyone. We're happy to be back with the latest update of Asia News. Still with me, Vanessa. China sends troops to 25 United Nations peacekeeping missions. According to the newly released White Paper on the participation of China's armed forces in the United Nations peacekeeping operations, China has sent over 40,000 armed forces to the United Nations peacekeeping missions over the past 30 years. The White Paper titled China Armed Forces 30 Years of United Nations Peacekeeping Operations are released by the State Council Information Office. According to the White Paper, China takes concrete actions to safeguard world peace and actively participate in the United Nations peacekeeping operations. In the United Nations peacekeeping operations, China Armed Forces will as always contribute to a safe and a stable environment for countries and regions in a conflict. According to the White Paper, in 1971, China recovered its legitimate seat in the United Nations and began to play a more active role in the international affairs after reform and opening up began in 1978, China gradually increased its involvement in the United Nations peacekeeping affairs. In addition, the White Paper says that in the past three decades, China's armed forces have sent 2,064 military professionals to 25 missions and UN headquarters. China is in favor of the United Nations measures in helping developing countries build peacekeeping and stabilization capability, improving troop and equipment capacities, and enabling peacekeeping forces to perform their duties. China supports the UN in strengthening the peacekeeping capability readiness system and will first select and deploy the units of the standby forces that meet the UN standards. Over the past 30 years, China's armed forces have contributed a growing number of peacekeepers across an expanding range of deployments. China's armed forces are now sending both form units and military professionals. Chinese military peacekeepers serve on the UN missions in engineer, medical, transport, helicopter, force protection and infantry units and as staff officers, military observers, and second officers. Mothers of newborns are afraid to risk coronavirus infection in Philippines. Mothers of newborns and healthcare workers expresses fears of infections risk due to the continuous rising number of coronavirus cases in the country. I feel scared giving birth during this pandemic. I fear that my baby and I could get infected with the virus inside the hospital. I also couldn't get a regular checkup since I was scared of traveling outside. During this pandemic, I only have one checkup. At the Dr. Jose Fabela Maternal Hospital, overcrowding has been a problem for many years. Mothers are forced to share beds with up to three different patients inside wards due to the high number of patients admit each day. With the constant need for the maternal health services, coupled with the continuous rise of the coronavirus cases, both mothers and health workers feel fear and anxiety. I'm scared that I will contact the virus here. I'm also scared for my baby, especially since her immune system is still weak. Diana Kahipe, a medical specialist, said the bulk of patients' numbers is not her greatest concern. Our problem really is that most or a lot of patients would deny having symptoms of COVID-19. I think this is uh, because of their fear or they are afraid of not getting admitted and have, they have already been refused uh, from other institutions. Uh, some would already have a COVID positive result and yet they would not volunteer that information. They would just tell us that after they have been intervened. And I think that poses a great risk, not only to us healthcare workers, but to other patients as well. The bulk of patients that come in, we can handle that. It's just that sometimes the stress of fear of getting COVID-19 really is, just adds to our stress. And because people have died because of COVID-19, and I personally know colleagues who have died from it. So it's really scary. And I, I'm just glad I'm working with people in this institution who are resilient enough to stay by me during this pandemic. Because exhaustion and fear, I think they have to be set aside because our patients need us. The Philippines Health Ministry reports 30,257 additional number of novel coronavirus infections, marking the 11th straight day the country have recorded more than 3,000 daily cases. 
The Philippines, with its population of 107 million, has the most infections and second highest number of the death tolls in Southeast Asia. South Korea extends level 2 social distancing curbs ahead of major national holiday. South Korea limits its indoor gatherings to below 50 and outdoor to less than 100 and maybe tighten limits for the Chuseok holiday when people traditionally reunite with the families. On September the 20th, there are 17 newly confirmed cases report from local communities. Among them, 55 patients were reported in capital area, 17 from non-metropolitan areas. The government has decided to extend the level 2 social distancing measures for areas outside the metropolitan area significantly until September 27. That is the same for the capital area. Authorities are expected to announce social distancing policies on Chuseok holiday. According to the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, South Korea reports 72 new coronavirus cases. The country has a total of 20,975 infections with 383 deaths. Clusters of infections from a church and political rally sparks a second wave of outbreaks, driving the daily tally to more than 400 before the numbers began dropping to the low 100s in early. At least one person deaths cause of the heavy rain in Vietnam. Tropical storm Nol makes landfall in Vietnam, kills one person, though authorities later downgrade the weather system. Voice of Vietnam says the storm killed one person and injured another while downing trees and damaging hundreds of houses. The state-run Voice of Vietnam says on its website the storm hit the tourist city of Da Nang and veers north to Tua Tinh Hue province before entering Laos. Surveillance footage from the center of the smart city monitoring and operation of the Tua Tinh Hue province, Hue IOC, shows the moment a utility pole fell on the passing motorcycles in Hue City. The motorcyclists are later seen emerging from the pile of branches and rushing towards safety. In addition, two or three newspapers says the men are killed by a falling tree and the television footage show flood streets in some areas. The government previously makes plan to evacuate up to half a million people when the storm were forecasted to have wind speeds of up to 135 kilometers or 84 miles an hour. The weather agency downgrades storm roll to a low pressure system, though warned it could still dump up to 250 millimeters or 9.8 inches of rain in parts of central Vietnam, potentially triggering floods and landslides. Thailand protesters begin anti-government demonstration in front of the university. Protesters break into Thammasat University as they began rallying in Bangkok to make the biggest demonstration to demand a former junta leader and now military back, Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha, a new constitution and elections. <laughs> There's been no justice. The students want to draw their own future, so we are here today to take care of them as a moral support. They will be our future, as well as we are hoping that, because of the youth, things will get better, even if it means there's only half of a democracy. Some talent protest leaders also demand reforms to curb the power of King Mahavajira Longhorn's monarchy. Hundreds of protesters gather around the campus of Tamasat University, as a hope of opposition to the military and realist establishment. Protesters are pushing and shoving the university gate after minutes of negotiation between the student protesters and a university official before they break through the gate and march in. Police says they expect up to join the protest. Talent politics has for years been marked by challenges to the royalist and military establishment by politicians backed by poor urban, rural voters and more recently by the student protesters. Related to the anti-government demonstrations, Thailand Prime Minister warns protesters against rising virus risks. In relation with the Thailand protesters' anti-government demonstration, Thailand's military-backed Prime Minister Prayut Chang Ocha warned protesters against heightening COVID-19 risks as they plan large anti-government demonstrations. When you gather in protest, you are creating an enormous risk of new infections, and with that, you also create enormous risk to the livelihoods of tens of millions of fellow Thais. Demonstrators held two months of demand for a junta leader and prime minister removal changed to a constitution they designed to extend military dominance after an election last year.
Prayut, a former army chief who says he was fairly elected, says in a televised speech that he understands the grievances but are just demonstrators to put COVID-19 first for now. Let me tell all protesters, now, loudly and clearly that I hear you have political grievances and that you have issues with the constitution. I respect your opinions. But right now, our country has some very much more immediately painful issues that it must address. That is the economic destruction brought about by COVID. Let's not make the situation worse than it is. Protest leaders expect ten of thousands together at the university and march to the government house. The demonstrations, though largely peaceful, have revived memories of more than a decade of intermittent unrest and protest street rallies that culminate in 2014 coup led by Prayut against the government of Yungluk Shinawatra. Myanmar and Chinese volunteers work together to combat COVID-19 in border. Chinese and Burmese volunteers work together on the front line against the COVID-19 epidemic in Rili City of southwest China's Yunnan province located on the border with Myanmar after two stowaways from Myanmar's test positive and put the city at risk for infection. Both patients are Myanmar nationals who enter China through Rili City. Burmese volunteers actively participate in the epidemic prevention and control work. Some Samong who lives in the Rili says it is convenient to take coronavirus tests with volunteers translating for them. Now there are 16 volunteers groups comprising more than 500 Chinese and Burmese people in Rili City who help conduct epidemic prevention and control work in factories, enterprises and business blocks. A total of 287,254 samples are collected and all the results come back negative. The two Myanmar patients are now in a stable condition. The deaths of COVID-19 victims are rising in Indonesia's capital. Related to the COVID-19 victim, the Junaidi being Hakim as a grave digger usually arrive home from work at 3 or 4 p.m. after pandemic. Junaidi working with 20 other team members at the Pondok Rangung Center Cemetery and they prepare up to 40 year pits in one day compared to just 10 before the coronavirus pandemic. Biasanya, rata -rata 10. Usually, we bury around 10 people every day. But for the last few days, when we handle COVID-19 burials, it has reached an average of 30 per day. And last Thursday, there are around 40 cases in one day. He adds he feels grateful to be involved in handling the funerals of COVID-19 victims. Maybe in this way, I can help others. While Junaidi's wife says she is very scared and worries because they have children at home, she worries the contagious disease because her husband works in cemetery as grave digger. I'm very scared because there are children in this house. I still have two children, so definitely I'm scared and worries. Experts such as epidemiologist Pandu Riono believe that a vaccine will not be the end all solution to Indonesia's coronavirus woes. A vaccine is one of the solutions to resolve the pandemic, but not in a short-term solution. It is for the long run. I don't think a vaccine can be considered as a short-term solution that it can solve the pandemic and help recover the economic problem. There is no way. We shouldn't be fooled by the notion that there are easy ways to cope with the pandemic. Relate to the International Coastal Cleanup Day, Philippines government clean up polluted coastline in artificial beach. Local residents rehabilitate stretch of shoreline in the Philippines capital as the government officials open the Manila Bay beach which are filled with artificial white sand. The 1500 meter stretch of shoreline which are filled with tons of sands from crushed dolomite boulders as part of an effort to beautify the heavily polluted area are open on the same day as the International Coastal Cleanup Day. While it is true and we agree that some of it are superficial aesthetic value, but the major issue here, that's why we're all here, is to clean up Manila Bay. Fernando Hiccup, president of Fisher Folk Group, Pamela Kaya, says the government should first rehabilitate Manila Bay before working on beautifying the polluted coastline. Isang araw dito sa area ng to yung fish kill. 
Just a few days ago, there was a fish kill mass death in this area. A few years ago, there were numerous fish kills in different towns nearby. There is still so much garbage. The government should focus more on rehabilitation before the beautification of Manila Bay. In the speech during the ceremony, Manila City Mayor Isco Moreno assured the public that the government wouldn't allow any kind of development in the city if it were a health threat. Malaysian recycler transform recycled plastic into new stuff. Volunteers gather on Malaysia Resort Island of Tioman to gather ocean-bound plastic that can be transformed into pellets and make into a range of products including auto parts, home appliances and furniture with help from a recycling plant. Everything is wrapped in plastic these days, so it's incredibly hard. So with recycling, you know, it's all well and good to um, I guess clean up the environment and recycle them into usable items that uh, people can make money off, but it's never going to um, it's never going to actually stop the situation if you don't tell people to stop using the plastic first and actually deal with the problem of it getting into the environment in the first place. In a WWF report looking at plastic packaging consumption in six Asian countries released earlier this year, Malaysia is one of the top consumers of plastic packaging with around 16 kg per person each year. Henhiap Industries, based in the southern Malaysia state of Johor, is one of a growing number of companies working with environmentalists to collect and remove plastic waste from Malaysian waters. In operation for 17 years, recycling 60,000 tons of plastic each year, 1,200 of that ocean-bound plastic that it buys from groups including the Sea Monkey Project. And because we see that marine pollution is becoming a problem, and we decided to focus in ocean-bound plastic material. With this, we are able to serve the conscientious consumer who are basically buying products that ranges from automotive, from home appliance, uh, from furniture. Kian is a new company create chairs of recycled plastics for restaurants and hotels launches a design during the pandemic that sells for about 77 and 50 cent dollar per unit. So this material is made from recycled ocean-bound plastic, which is mainly made from yogurt pots, you know, like the yogurt that you eat, the container. So these are actually stronger than the mineral water bottles that you drink from, the PET bottles we call it. And once these are manufactured and uh, recycled, uh, they are made into little pellets that's then injected into the chair. Uh, machine that makes up these chairs that you see behind me. We really believe in better world. As much as, as much cliche as it may sound, but we really believe that there is more than just us and this earth is shared. And what more is a better way if we can include uh, sustainable material as part of our raw material. And every product that we make, we know that we are doing something for the environment. The pellets are eventually sold to dozens of companies working in a number of fields, including home appliances, cosmetic packaging, toys and household products. The report looks at China, Malaysia, the Philippines, the Thailand and Vietnam, which contribute 60% of the estimated 80 million tons of plastic that enter the world's oceans each year. On the third Saturday of September this year marks the Coastal Cleanup Day, when various groups and volunteers remove trash from water bodies around the world. And this is the end of today's episode. Have a lovely weekend with your loved ones and see you soon.